Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. I apologize. I'm laughing because I just did that thing that I do many times. And I turn to my right and I see my older daughter mouthing the exact words that I'm saying as I'm saying them. Apparently, daddy has become a bit of a joke in his own household. How do you like them apples? Speaking of jokes in their own household, I was going to introduce this person as with the usual flowery verbiage that I do, but now I'm just going to say introducing on the pod, my competition. Now, apparently you think, you know, someone and you turn around to go get them like a nice beverage or a cookie or something. And they stab you in the back. What is that? Every <laughs> <Friend> single appearance, <laughs> yes. every single appearance that I've had on this podcast has, has it's been a part of a mission. It's yeah. Part of a mission to steal your listeners. I've, I've, I've quietly come on. I quietly came on and tried to be good at the beginning, then started to completely derail your podcast, every other appearance. And, uh, and, and, and it's all been part of a mission to steal your listeners and bring them on to, I now have a podcast and bring them onto mine. I'm going to, I'm going to pump up your podcast, which all joking aside is uh, the whole one episode I've listened to is, is excellent. But it's more excellent pod podcasts on your podcast are going to come, but I have to make this reference first. You know who you are? And this is topical because he just had the best game he's had in, I don't know, half a decade. You're Deandre Jordan. The Knicks thought they were doing themselves a solid by bringing him aboard to try to lead up the KD recruitment. Little did they know, <laughs> little did they know that he was going to go air all of their dirty laundry and, and take take the talent with him uh, to Brooklyn, as it were. So how do you how do you feel about that? I mean, you made it all first team all NBA. So that's a nice accomplishment for you. Very nice job. That's so that's so good. I mean, uh, that's hilarious. If, if I can be honest, I've thought of myself as more of a Royale Ivy. Than a DeAndre Jordan. He's the other. He's years. the other guy I was thinking of. He's the other guy. Yeah, I thought of myself as more of a Royal Ivy, but you know what? I'll take it. That's hilarious. Yes, I did start a podcast. It's called Cats and Shoot. It's subscription only. You can subscribe to it on Patreon.com. You can go to Patreon.com/slash Cats and Shoot. K A T Z and S H O O T. And uh, you can subscribe there. You can get one episode a week for five dollars a month. You can get two episodes a week for ten dollars a month. You get to ask me questions. I'm doing mailbags, answering your questions directly. If you're in the ten dollar tier, uh, had Ian Begley on the first episode, which aired on Monday, and Ian was obviously amazing. He always is, and just recorded the second episode, uh, you know, earlier on Wednesday, and it went up Wednesday afternoon with Nate Duncan. So I'm feeling great about it. I have, unfortunately, my guests next week are taking. Uh, kind of a downturn. Kind of a downturn? Yeah, a little bit of a downturn, but it's okay. We'll make up for it. You can patiently patiently wait to see who, see who my my next guest is. But, you know, it's, it's going to be disappointing. But no otherwise, the pot will be great. No spoilers. No, in, in all seriousness, and I texted you when uh, I first found... Uh, you, we first talked about the fact that you, you're doing a pod and obviously I'm thrilled for you because um, you should have a pod. And the reason you should have a pod is twofold. One, and I realized this at the end of when we usually record, which is like, man, I, I probably should have done a lot better job at like needling uh, Fred for all of the shit that he doesn't think is that interesting, but which our my listeners and me, by the way, find just like utterly fascinating. We don't have enough time to do that on this show nearly enough. And all that stuff I feel like is going to come out on your pod because it already has. And then the second compliment I'm going to give you is you're, with the exception of one of next week's guests, um, you're going to get great guests on the pod. Like Ian, like you guys are just sh shooting the shit about I forget what topic. And then you get on the topic of Mitch and then like Ian casually drops like, oh, yeah, you know, neg negotiation um, negotiations with Mitch's extension were like, they got a little contentious with the Knicks uh, at some point, you know, w leading up to when he ultimately signed the extension, which is like not something that I don't think I was ever reported. And Ian just like casually drops this nugget. And I just can't wait for you to have guests on every week that like casually drop either uh, analysis or like good information or whatever the case may be. So um, it's just super exciting to, to have someone like you doing this because you should be doing it. Well, thank you. I'm very excited about it. It's not my first podcast. I will say... Your endorsement was far greater than my father's. I, I texted the link to sign up 
to my dad. Patreon.com slash cats and shoot. You can only, if you search it on your podcast, on your podcast app, if you search on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it, if you search it, uh, you, you will not, you will not find it. You have to subscribe on patreon.com slash and you have cats and shoot. And you have to type in cats and shoot because me being the idiot that I am when I first went to the Patreon, I typed Fred cats and nothing came up. So you have to type in cats. Well, and yes, shoot. that's not the name of the podcast. It's not called Fred cats. It's called, it's called cats and shoot. And you can sign up for one of two tiers, get one episode a week, two episodes a week. John, it's patreon.com slash cats and shoot. I can't believe the one time I don't change my name and the supers on the podcast, right? Like it just says normally That's, on the video, yeah. I change it to something ridiculous like Victor Wembanyama's mama's pajamas. And like now it's just like I'm just Fred Katz right now. And why I didn't make it patreon.com slash cats and shoot. Lord, Lord only knows. Uh, but I sent it, I sent it to like my family chat. And my, my dad said, oh, you know, you're finally going to get me to sign up for my first podcast. And I said, dad, this is like my fifth podcast. <laughs> you didn't listen to any of them at all. Don't feel you, didn't, you didn't listen to Thunder After Dark. You didn't listen to OKC Dream Team. You didn't, didn't listen to Locked on Thunder. You didn't listen to Wizards After Dark. You don't listen to the Athletic NBA show that I'm on every week. You've never listened to any. Never, never listened. He texted me. So, he's really, he's, he's very proud of you. He just, he's he also, one of, he's a big head. He also texted me, how do you subscribe? And I was like, just follow the link. He said, no, how do you subscribe to things? I've never subscribed to anything. So I think he's a little behind on the times with this one. I don't know if it's going to be his first podcast. Um, like first podcast he's ever listened to, period. Oh, yeah. Yeah, That's but phenomenal. like he, he doesn't even know how to subscribe to things. So like, you know, he um, can't even figure out like Amazon Prime. That's, I mean, listen, my mother's 73, 74, and she goes through a lot of the, the same. Hi, mom. I know you're listening to this, but she like, say, well, she'll at say least, At least she knows well. how to do a podcast, though. She's listening. Well, <laughs> but I actually think she watches everything because I don't think she knows how to get the podcast like just on like apple i don't know if she even has the apple podcast act. anyway uh this is clearly what people came to hear about let's talk about the knicks um the the uh the the frisky knicks who maybe didn't do themselves any favors by when I, I wonder what would do i see that i'm going to test your knowledge what would the margin of victory against the hornets have would have would it have had to have been for them to not qualify do you know this because i don't i think i think if it was eight or higher then they would so as long as they won by more than that's because i know that was the the what i saw you you and others report going into today the yesterday but then i I wasn't sure if that changed because like boston won by a certain amount or whatever but it was they needed to win by eight or more okay right but boston winning by a certain amount got them the division over orlando that's or the group over orlando can we discuss something important Please, yeah. Group group eight. Okay, I, I'm kind of a convert. I, I've decided in the last 24 hours, I kind You're of the NCAA tournament's fun. I, I'm kind of in. A uh, couple things need to be changed. What? First first of all, the groups A, B, C. It's ridiculous. Like, it should just be divisions. Just go back to divisions, you know? Like, it, yeah. it makes geographical sense. It's the it is the logistically easiest for everybody. I know these were put together in an effort to try to make the divisions as fair as possible because they were done or the groups by as fair as possible because they were done by last year's records. But nobody knows who's in what group. I could not list to you. I literally study this stuff for a living and I couldn't list to you all the groups like at least it's a way to make divisions relevant again. And they haven't been relevant. because They aren't. Yeah. Yeah. And they haven't been relevant in in forever. So it's a way to kind of make it relevant and maybe rehash some old rivalries and that kind of stuff. So it should be the divisions. And the other reason why it should be the divisions is because group play is a terrible name. It's awful. It sounds like a porn category. It's a horrible (laughs) name. My God. I actually I have something relevant to add to this. I'm reading uh Oh, I told you. I texted you. This. I'm reading Seth Rogen's uh, book, uh, your book, and he 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 uh, talks about having gone to the like the porn awards 
one year. I forget what the name of there's like a real name, but he said they have like a million categories. I wonder if group play actually is a real category in gotta be. those awards. It should be. There's a category for everything. Um, there's got to be. And it, it, it's knockout rounds is unnecessary. Like the knockout round is such an unnecessarily. That's such an unnecessary name. The knockout round is just the quarterfinals. That's I've it. just been calling it the quarterfinals because Me too. who the hell knows what the knockout? Why do you need the knockout round? Why can't you call it the quarterfinals? Why can't you just say that? Why do you have to call one round of it the knockout round? And then the next is the semifinals? And the next is the championship game? Why, why can't you just call it the quarterfinals? I have to jump in. Fred. Oh, God. Do you watch any soccer? No. I okay. watch Ted Lasso. It is so clear, and I speak on behalf of every single international listener, that oh, you God. don't know ball. Okay? Because this no, is exactly I don't, I don't know anything how the about entire soccer. world outside of our our... 50 Can I bubble thinks of every single tournament. The World Cup has a knockout round and group play. Every single soccer thing. This is what the whole thing was based off of was the in-season tournament. The NBA chose it was based off of soccer or football, as the rest of the world calls it. So I, all I'm saying, and I'll let you get back to your pod, is you're American and showing. That's, Can I make that's, that's fine. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. Yes. It, international group play sounds like another porn subcategory <laughs> of group play. So you're making my point for me. In fairness, okay. there's probably more crossover between porn and uh, soccer than there is NBA basketball and, and soccer. But but I digress. Um, I I have an actual suggestion that does not have to do with semantics. That, that would be a great point counterpoint. Anytime. Um, this is not semantics, and it's going to tap into what the first thing I want to talk to you about, which is I read the comments from Tom Thibodeau after the game. I could, I didn't get a chance to see him um, say them and certainly wasn't in the room for them. Um, like you were, I don't see why making the in season tournament can't be the first tiebreaker for either playoff seating, or if it's, it comes down to like the AC versus the nine seed, whatever, um, or God forbid 10th versus 11th in the plane, out of the plane, because I was doing the post game last night and I was like genuinely conflicted because like, oh, great. We get to play the Bucks a fifth time. And then as our reward for that, we either host, I correct me if I'm wrong, host the Celtics or go to Indiana. Neither of those sound like particularly delightful options, or maybe it's the other way around. We go to Boston or go to whatever it is. It's too no, really I think they'd be on the road for both because they're the wild. Card, yeah, they, right? you're right. You're right. Because we're the wild card. Yeah. Either way. Lots of unpleasantness uh, there. And then getting to the typical part of it, like reading his comments to me, they read the comments of a guy who's like sitting up there and saying the thing he knows he has to say. But like deep down, he's like, fuck. <laughs> now, like, because we didn't need, like, we really needed this. So I, I ask you, like, what do, what do you think of A, my suggestion, and B, what Thibodeau thinks of, of all this? I interpret it similarly. There you I will go. also say that the beat writers kind of have a running joke that if we ever, if the Knicks ever win a title under Tibbs, that we have like a running joke on what he would be like in the press conference after they win the title. Like we, we'd be like, Tom, you, 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 you want a title? How you feeling? Is what's this feeling of excitement? This is what you've been prepping for for your whole life, winning a title as an NBA coach. And he would just be like, you know, we just got to get back in tomorrow, and <laughs> next season's right around the corner. I'm like, when when's the joy coming? When when if, if if you're not experiencing the joy, then when are what are you working for? So I I I do think Tibbs has this way of maintaining that same tibsiness at all mm -hmm. moments. I also think that he is very conscious of the tibsiness. Like he, he will lean into it too. And he plays, he plays the character. I, I do think he, look, he's not a dumb man. Like he, he understands no. what's good for the league and he actually does have a lot of opinions on things that are good for the league, not good for the league. You know, like, for example, like he thinks you'll be shocked to know, like he thinks load management is a big problem in the NBA. 
And that's not out of character for him. He's also not wrong. And the NBA completely agrees with him. It's a huge problem. It's probably the biggest problem plaguing the league right now. Uh, And so like he has lots of opinions on the league and how it should be run and all of that. I think he really does see the good in the in-season tournament in terms of the interest, in terms of making players play harder. I actually asked him as the last question of the post-game press conference last night. I asked him because he took out Brunson with about two minutes left. And then like Jericho Sims came in with like a minute 45 and they weren't absolutely a hundred percent in at that point. They were almost definitely in. They weren't absolutely a hundred percent in and point differential mattered. And I, I asked Tibbs if uh, he should finally be criticized for not playing his starters enough. And he leaned into it. You know, that's just like, that's just what he, that's just what he does. Uh, But like, I think he knows that that kind of stuff is good for the league. Them playing harder, people want to play more, all that kind of stuff. I also think that there is no amount of money that you could win in the in-season tournament that would make him care enough to not, to do anything that would jeopardize his chance at winning a title. I really don't think there is any amount of money. I do not think that you can like buy off tips. He's not, he's not bribable. He's not, he, that man has one singular purpose in life. He has one single singular objective in life. And, and I, I, I'm with you. Like my reaction is damn. So they advance. It is the same as yours. I listened to you post game last night. Like it was the same as yours. It was damn. So they advanced and now they got Milwaukee on the road. I mean, I wrote it in my story I, it, for this yeah. morning where I, I said like, there, it is a very defensible point that the next best case scenario on Tuesday was they beat Charlotte by like four <laughs> and then they have it. They don't get into the end season tournament. They still have a win and the regular season record. And then they can, you know, go into next week and maybe they have a bad team and they get more off days coming up. So maybe, maybe that's, that's a, you know, that, that I think that's a flaw, but I also think that's a flaw that is possible to be ironed out. Like I had Nate, Nate Duncan on my podcast, cats and shoot, patreon.com slash cats and shoot. I had Nate on my podcast earlier today and he made a suggestion of like, so the championship game doesn't count towards the regular season, but he made a suggestion of like the one way that you, it, it's similar to yours in terms of breaking tiebreakers. Oh, I think I if you win, going. if you win the championship game, <laughs> you get an extra win. But if you lose the championship game, you, don't, you don't get a loss. It doesn't count. And I was really into that because it's like, okay, that will break, that will break a tiebreaker. If Why did they that. do that? It's a good idea. It's a great it's fucking. It's a, it's, it's, <laughs> that would be a great reward, and and it, and it would be a great reward for winning it. Because for me, like if you're someone like Tibbs and you can't be bought, and you don't care about the money, and you just care about winning as many regular season and postseason games as you can. Like, why would you churn out all of your best stuff, any of your best stuff for that championship game when you're playing against presumably a good to great team and you're going to have to play them at least twice during the regular season? And if you're a team that has a chance at the finals, you know, if you're like Boston and you might play that team in the finals or something, why would you bust out your good stuff? Why would you bust out all of your best packages for defending their other best player yeah. and all of that? Like you wouldn't want to show them anything. You wouldn't want to give that stuff away. So like, but like, I, I'm kind of more into the concept just because players are into it and they're definitely playing harder and they're openly talking about how that money is making them play harder. And the hard stuff is, with the watch, is that how much a Rolex? I have no concept of anything. Is does a Rolex cost a half mil? There's no way that a Rolex could cost a half mil. I, Fred, you could but tell maybe, me a Rolex costs a hundred thousand. You could tell me it costs a million. I, I well, a million probably would be a, a lot. Maybe, maybe there's a half million dollar Rolex that he wants, or okay. I know he loves watches, or he just loves watches and is like. I'm gonna get a watch. Also, it's not really a half million. Got to pay taxes. That's Maybe true. Rolex is two fifty. <laughs> that's a lot that's more fair. than my car. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I so I want to. I, I like how I said we we're going to talk about two things today. I'm going to divert yet again before we get to either topic. Quickly though, um, 
because you just brought up the no pun intended. Uh, you just brought up Tibbs and the notion of uh, like getting the only thing that matters to him is getting closer to a championship. Off the, we don't have to go deep into this. What if you g- put give Tibbs true serum and you asked him what do you think is the biggest development so far this year, either with your team or I guess you could say with another team out there? Like I can't imagine what that answer would be. That would that is going to help you in your effort to get a championship. What do you, what do you think he'd say? I think his answer on truth serum would be the same as his answer not on truth serum. Which is? Uh, I think he would say Mitch. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I was going to I was gonna go with Brunson turning into like mini Steph Curry from deep, but Mitch is probably the right answer. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think knowing him, how much he prioritizes a rim protector, how much he, he, you know, believes in building his defense from the paint out. Like their defense was not that good last regular season. It got good in the playoffs, Yeah, but they were really good defensively in that Cleveland series. They were, you look at their defense. Now they're fifth in the league in points allowed per possessions. Yeah. And, and there are various reasons for it. They're getting more turnovers, way more turnovers. They forced very few turnovers last year. Now they're top 10 in turnover rate defensively. And if you investigate that, you're like, okay, why are they forcing more turnovers? You're like, well, the ball pressure is better. I do think Grimes has been good on ball pressure. They've had Josh Hart for the whole season, as opposed to the last 25 games of the season, which definitely helps. DiVincenzo is really good in passing lanes. And if I had to give you one reason why they've been forcing more turnovers, and I could only credit one person, and that was it. The person I would credit is Mitch, because he's been so good defending, picking rolls, getting his hands in lanes, shutting down passes that used to be easy passes. And even if he's not getting the turnover, guys are just making sloppy plays. Uh, You talk about the fact that the rim protection is good. Well, number one reason for that is Mitch. Uh, You talk about the fact that they are like top five in the league at not fouling on defense. Well, the number one reason for that is because Mitch like hasn't been in foul, has been in foul trouble like once all season. I don't think, has he had five, I'm going to look it up while you're talking. I don't think he's had to 5,000 a game yet this year. You may know. Yeah, I, I don't. He had three in the first half of, of one game. Yes. Um, yeah. And I don't think he's had five. His foul rate is lower than ever. And this is a dude who used to run and jump after, you know, every single shot. Like a lot of young bigs do. What? I remember. His, I mean, I, I just, I think their defense has been a lot better for a lot of reasons. Uh, four fouls twice, according to your wonderful producer, Andrew Claudio. There we go. Uh, but, but I just think, I know, we, I feel like we just talk about, like we just talk about Mitch every podcast, but it's like kind of deserved now. Like his leap is ginormous and it's exactly the type. I also think Tibbs is like really proud of Mitch. He mentions him <laughs> all the time. Like, I think, I think he's really proud both of the way that Mitch has developed and really proud probably of the way that he's developed Mitch. You know, Mitch is this goofy, affable dude who is not like RJ, you know, like didn't grow up the same way as RJ. RJ's mom, when RJ was 10 years old, RJ's mom was lining him up in front of his television and interviewing him after games that he played, pretending to be like a muckraking that's, journalist that's wild. who was trying to get a sensationalist answer out of RJ so that she could like turn him against the team, you know? And she would ask him questions. She would be like, so RJ, you played great tonight. Can you tell me about your 24 points? And RJ would start to answer and she would cut him off and she would say, no, it's, it's not about you. Don't acknowledge you played great. It's about the team. It's about the teammates. It's not about you. They're going to say you're selfish. If you acknowledge that premise, you know, and it was stuff like that from like 10 years old, like RJ was raised to be a pro and, and, and look, it's ultimately it's on the person of whether they're going to be a hard worker or not. And credit to RJ, he definitely is. And everybody who's ever been around him says he is. And ultimately that's on him, but he had these values and not just the values, but the way to execute on it. Like his dad was a pro. His dad is the GM of the Canadian national team. His mom was an athlete. Like he was, he was the number one ranked recruit in North America at one point when he was coming up. He went to Duke. Like 
he had all of these examples of what it's supposed to look like. So by the time he came to the league, he was already insanely mature beyond his years. And Mitch grew up very differently. He grew up in a very different way. And sometimes there are guys who want to work hard or think they're working hard and have all the right intentions. And they just, they've never been around that. They don't know what it looks like. They're not, they're not trained from a young age in order to do it. And I think Mitch is one of those guys who's like changed as he's gotten older and he's realized, okay, this is what I do. And his habits have changed and what he prides himself on has, has changed. And it's not because he was ever, you know, selfish. It's just because like you learn stuff as you get older and everybody has a different starting point. And, and I think Tibbs is, I bet Tibbs is really proud of that development with Mitch and, and, you know, he'll touch on that every once in a while. And I think he's definitely very proud of the leap that Mitch has made because he's like a huge Mitch fan. I mean, he had a nice soliloquy about Robinson after the game last night, which I enjoyed um, reading. Yeah. And is it fair to say at this point, other than um, Embiid, you know, doing whatever he could potentially do, which you and Ian talked about extensively, and I'm, I'm not going to spoil. Go, go, go subscribe to Cats and Shoot on Patreon.com. Um, but Patreon.com uh, slash Cats and Shoot. Slash, there you go. And that's um, my last name, Cats, K A T Z <laughs> and Shoot. Patreon.com uh, slash Cats and Shoot. Other than Embiid, like something happening with Embiid, would it be fair to say that it, that it would, it would surprise me? Would it surprise you if they, swapped out Mitch for like any other center at, you know, over the next like year or two. Yeah. I mean, he's also on a really good contract. It's a great freaking contract. That's a great team friendly contract. That contract has turned into, I mean, I don't, I forget is all, is all defense positionless now. I know all. I'm no, NBA. no, it's not all defense is not, but all I'm it NBA. is not positionless. Yeah. Which right. makes it, which which is going to make it an up? Does he have that as a incentive? No, I don't I'll think look, so. I don't think I don't he does. Think he has, no, he doesn't. He doesn't have any incentives. Uh, I'm almost certain he doesn't have any incentives. I think the only guys with unlikely incentives on the team are Fournier, RJ, Hartenstein. I know has some ridiculous. Hart Hartenstein's are now likely. They're not. Oh, unlikely. are they? Because he, he accomplished them last year. Hartenstein's were oh. like make the playoffs and play 1500 minutes and something. oh i didn't okay that job yeah. by me i thought they were unlikely okay, um, sorry. and julius julius has like one unlikely i think and then divincenzo has a bunch of unlikelies yeah uh but i don't think i don't, I don't think mitch does either yeah. but but what i was gonna say is like you look at the all defense picture off the top of my head through 17 games i probably would not have him on there because Rudy Gobert, Gobert has been incredible and Bam Adebayo has been incredible. And those are probably the guys who I'd have one and two in defensive player of the year. Uh, I, I think Mitch has to be on the spreadsheet though. Like he has to be, you got to look at him. You got to look at him. He's been that good defensively. It could be one of those situations where a guy doesn't make all defense, but he, he makes, let's say he comes in the top five in defense player. I mean, sh- I guess there's a theoretically a possibility he'd come in third in defense, but he could be like one of the final ballot spots and not make all defense. Um, although there's some, I would like OG Ananobi's having a great year defensively. There's some other people too. Um, okay. I want to move on to talk real quickly, which is like the main thing I want to talk to you about today. Before you do, John, I'm yes. staring at the CBA now. All defense is positionless. Are you sure? I, Zach Lowe, I thought you would have known this. Zach Lowe said a couple of weeks ago when he was talking to Nikias, like I listened to the conversation. And they it's seemed the, uncertain about it. Right. They did I'm, seem uncertain about it. I listened to that episode. Right? Right. That was why I from that <laughs> conversation, he is approaching this year as if all defense is positionless. And I would assume the next episode he would have come on and done his Zach Lowe thing. Like I talked to the league and they told me oh, that okay. it's this or this. I'm staring at someone named John Carolus, who then replied to a tweet that said it's all it's positionless. And then he replied when someone was like, you don't know anything with a copy of the CBA. So I'll go through this to make sure. But OK, yeah, John, John, John Corrales, he covers the Celtics. He's a good then reporter. there you go. <laughs> OK, so he knows what he's talking about. Got it. Yeah, no, he's a Celtics beat reporter. He's a very on behalf reporter. of journalism. It looks like all defense is positionless. Well, then, I don't know if that changes your calculation on Mitch oh. or not. 
Oh, it, absolutely it definitely does. does. Of course <laughs> yeah. it does. Well, there are going to be a disproportional amount of centers on that list. And yeah. yeah, I mean, you're basically saying, do you think Mitch is having one of the 10 best defensive seasons and in he, the league? And I think he is. Yeah, I think he is. He's He's been... He has been fantastic. And, He's really been fantastic. And you know what the, the proof of that is? Well, maybe I shouldn't say. This would be a good transition. I was going to say they're the Knicks are fifth best defense in the league right now, and there isn't another player on the team that you would seriously consider giving real thought to putting on all defense. And yet, as I say that, there is one guy who in the back of my mind, I'm like, well... He's not quite there, but if there was a second guy that I would at least try to make an argument for, it would be Emmanuel quickly um, because of all the things that we've talked about over the last year, um, which is a good transition, I think, to talk about the story that you wrote. Was it earlier this week or was it last week? I'm losing track of time. On Quickly and Bronson? Yes, on Quickly and Bronson. Uh, on Monday. It was on Monday. Okay. So it was close yeah. to last week. Um, yeah, after the Phoenix game. And you really kind of did this like, I thought a really good 10,000 foot view of the situation, I'll call it, where the Knicks have a guy who was their best player. I don't think any, I mean, everybody always disputes everything. I don't think any reasonable person would dispute that Jalen Brunson is the best player. And then a guy who on a lot of nights looks like their second best player, uh, you know, and I looked up all the advanced metrics today. You know, there's an advanced metric right now. One of the, one of the basketball reference ones. I forget if it's VORP or, or win shares or box plus minus. Someone has him like one of those has him like 30th or like 28th in the league this year. He's high. He finished 30 something in Raptor last year, the 538 metric. Like he is, as you wrote about, really, really good. And it's this really unique situation that we've been dealing with for a while now where the, the Knicks best player and this other guy who's falling somewhere behind him in the ranking, but not too far behind basically plays the same position and this this larger dynamic of it's a team building question it's a night to night minutes question you could zoom in as much as you want you could zoom out as much as you want any way you look at it this is i would argue if not the most relevant like big picture thing with the roster right now forgetting about who they might trade for it's right up there so i i kind of just want to like toss it to you and be like well, what do you think should happen with, like, do you think that there is like a reasonable course of action or a reasonable direction this thing could take given all the factors at play? And I ask that knowing that there are a shit ton of factors at play, which is what makes it an interesting topic, I think, to, to at least think about. Very loaded question. It is. I, I, so t t pick it apart. Take, take it any way you want. We don't, I mean, we don't have to do the whole thing right now. We could, This will be something we should revisit because I think it's an ongoing thing. That'll, that'll be... Yeah, throughout the season. Unquestionably. I mean, I, I think you could argue it's, I mean, you know, will the Knicks trade for a star and which one, I guess, is really the biggest uh. question. But I, I'm i kind of bored of that, to be exactly. honest. <laughs> I'm so bored of that. I'm just ready for them to, to do it or not. I don't have anything new to say about it. Uh, this is certainly up there as one of the biggest questions for the Knicks. Like, what is to come of Emmanuel quickly after they didn't, agree to an extension before this season. And I don't think they were really close to agreeing to an extension. And the reason why they weren't close is partly because quickly believed the market was different than what the Knicks believed the market, like quickly saw the Devin Vassell and the McDaniels contract and was like, okay, those guys are getting 135, and I'm, you know, reigning runner up for six man of the year. And, the year before, Jordan Poole gets that huge deal. Tyler Hero gets that huge deal. Both his bench players finishing top three and six man of the year. And mm -hmm. I think quickly saw himself in that category. His agent saw him in that category. And I think that's justifiable. Uh, and then on the Knicks side, they were like, can we pay this much for a guy who we don't believe has a future with Jalen Brunson as more than an off the bench guy? And so to me, the big question that that leads you to is okay, but what would have to change yes. in order for you to not think he was a just off the bench guy. Yep. And it's not like they don't play quickly and Brunson together. They, they closed yep. with quickly and Brunson a lot last year and with smashing success. 
When those guys played together last year, the Knicks were plus 12 per 100 possessions, according to Cleaning the Glass. That is a fantastic number. And it doesn't necessarily mean that those guys are going to be amazing together against every single kind of lineup forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And it doesn't mean that somebody might figure it out. And it doesn't even mean that you have to keep quickly and, and you'll find a way to work it out because of that number. But it does mean that in a pretty large sample last year, playing those two guys together not only didn't prevent you, not only didn't turn you into a bad team, yeah. it didn't prevent you from being a fantastic one. And chances are it had a pretty good impact on, on you getting fantastic results when you play two of your best players at the same time. Uh, I think, and I didn't write this in the story, but it's something that I've thought about. It's better to muse about in the podcast than it is to write. I think they would have, and this is my personal opinion. This is not me reporting anything. This is just like my opinion and my analysis. But I think that question is easier to answer if the Knicks have a big two-way wing who can shoot and guard. I think if you have somebody who can, like OG Ananobi, who can guard the other team's best player all the time, will shoot threes, will be good on offense, and can just kind of be a switchblade, then... I think it's a lot easier to play Brunson and quickly together more. The thing with quickly and, and the reason why he's a really good defender and he's a thing. He's the best. He's, he's the best team defender on their perimeter for sure. Yep. And he's one of the best team defenders in the perimeter on the league. That's what I was getting up for. Yeah. Yes. No question. But the thing with quickly is that they never use him to guard the ball. It, because, and, and I think it's a little bit of chicken and egg stuff where it's like, it's partly because his on-ball defense is it's partly because his off-ball defense is so damn good that they mm -hmm. value keeping him in the corner and keeping him as a director and 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 that's a really important position inside of Tibbs defense too because you need to be able to have both the smarts and the quickness to be able to collapse into the lane as a helper and then close back out on a shooter in the corner and you have to be able to read the game incredibly fast and you have to be super agile physically as well very few people have that combination and quickly unquestionably does. Uh, but, but there's also a, a large gap between his off ball defense and his on ball defense. Not that his on ball defense is bad. It's obviously not, but he's a wonderful off ball defender and he can still get muscled when he's on the ball. And he's not the type of versatile guy who is going to guard all these different kinds of players. And with, with Brunson, that's, that can prove to be a problem. If you go up against a team like Boston, which is just really oh, well. big, I, I could see you really struggling on the defensive end because of that stuff. So I understand the reservations. But sometimes basketball reality just like deviates from basketball theory completely, you know? And the thing that you didn't think was going to make sense, like you watch it and you're like, it just makes sense. And I think the Knicks might have, I'm open to that being the case with Quickly and Brunson, you know? I, I mean, I'm extremely open to it. I, my, my bigger question is how it would take place it, from a practical standpoint of a, like a team building standpoint, which you just brought up because like... So, for instance, like the notion of him starting. I don't see him ever starting as long as R.J. Barrett and Julius Randle are both here and Jalen Brunson are, are like we're you know, you and again, you and Ian talked about how Quentin Grimes and we could talk. We don't have to talk about it because you guys talked about it. And it's been talked about enough this season about like how much of it is on Grimes, how much of it is on the team like the, But the fact is, Grimes has. Is it the lowest usage rate or the second or what? one of the lowest usage rates in the leagues amongst guys who have played that many minutes and, and so on and so forth? So now you're going to like the notion that you're going to move quickly in there and who's taking the haircut. It's like it's I, so I, I think he's in the right role on this team. I think he should be the sixth man on this team. The fact that he winds up on a lot of nights playing 26, 25, 24 minutes is uh, is not ideal. I don't know that there's a great answer for it, a great way around it. And and by the way, we saw like the other night in Phoenix, 
Tibbs does have it in his back pocket to put the dude in at the five minute mark or six minute mark, whatever he put him in. It was like five thirty, and just not take him off the court for the rest of the game. So like he can still do that if he needs to. I guess I'm not as worried about that, and I'm more worried about okay if if you really do invest in quickly, and you think he could be a starter down the line in addition, different iteration of that of the team. So like you bring up OJ and Obi coming in, like I, I I don't know how many other moving pieces there would need to be. Right, because then, like, who's your is, is Brunson your number one? Is OG your number two? Is quickly your number three? Like, who's playing the is OG that the four? I, we're saying OG, like whoever that version of a of a big wing, right? I don't know. It just it it brings up a lot of questions, and it kind of leads me back to the to the same place we started, which is that as long as he's here, I think the odds are in favor of him continuing to be a six man. Which is like, is that going to cut it? Is that going to cut it for the Knicks? Is that going to cut it for quickly? And and I don't I don't know what we do with that because the, I mean the guy is just awesome and I and it le- it leaves my head spinning I'll, 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 honestly and I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, look, I I think there's one way that you can kind of edit things on the margins, which is he doesn't have to play 24 minutes a game. He okay. does. He doesn't. He he can play 29. Like you can sure you can switch his and Josh Hart's minutes. You know, you can like like right now. Art is the first sub into the game for RJ Barrett. Yep. And Tibbs is a big proponent of lineup data. So this is a change that I could see him making at some point. Watch out for the 20 game marker. Okay. Just watch out for that. Tibbs, and again, not reporting. This is a prediction based on things that I know about Tibbs. Tibbs is a big proponent of lineup data. And at around the 20 game marker or so, is when he feels like he kind of has enough of a sample to be able to look at his most used lineups and take some stuff away from it. He's already starting to look at the starting lineup and that bench unit. And like right now, the starting lineup has played 368 possessions together. That bench unit, which is awesome, the quickly DiVincenzo, Hart, Barrett, uh, Hartenstein, has played 195. And and I know that he looks at those numbers. Starting lineups plus 5.2 per 100. The Second unit is plus 10.3 for 100. And I know that he's already looking at those busters. numbers. Totally. And I already know he's, I know he's already looking at those numbers and being like, okay, well, you know what? These are working. And I know it factors into his decisions about starting lineups and all that stuff. And like, yeah, well, if you move, if you move ground, I'm not saying he's like thinking about yeah. moving Grimes to the bench, but I'm like, what enters his equation if you ask him, like, would you consider moving Grimes to the bench is, well, I don't want to mess with the bench unit. That that unit's plus ten point three per hundred. They're running teams out of the building. It's been huge for us. I don't want to. I don't want to mess with that. And the reason I mention this is because I just I wonder when you get to twenty games because there is one lineup that the Knicks have used more than their all bench unit and less than their starting lineup, and it's the starters without RJ Barrett and with Josh Hart, which and sucks. That, and that is the lineup that they play for a nice little portion of every first and third quarter because mm-hmm. Hart is the first sub in for RJ because they have to stagger RJ with the bench unit. And at some point, that lineup that lineup is minus 9.7 per 100. So as good as that bench unit is, that's how bad that lineup with Hart has been. Uh, and it's And it's... It's not over as many games because Hart stood in as a starter for a little bit and they got killed yeah. in those minutes with Hart as a as a spot starter for RJ. But like it's just a thing that I'm keeping my eye on because that unit is getting killed. Tibbs cares about lineup data, net rating, all that kind of stuff. And I know it's not like he like takes it blindly. He's got to look at it and say, okay, why is this working? Why is it not working? But when I watch that unit, Teams aren't defending Josh Hart in the perimeter. Hart hasn't been. He was really good in the Charlotte game. I, I was about he, to say maybe the maybe he's turned a corner, but, but keep going. Yeah. Yes. He was really good in the Charlotte game. But even when he's really good, it's not like teams are like closing he, out Hart on Josh Hart. Hart. That's not his game. <laughs> There's just not like teams are closing out on RJ now. They're respecting his jumper in the corner, especially. Mm-hmm. And and they're they're guarding him more. That extra spacing is important for Brunson. It's important for Randall. Like, I think it makes sense. Like the reason that lineup is bad is because they can't score. That lineup has a 45% effective field goal percentage. That's disastrous. That's, That's so horrendous. So horrendous. And like, maybe that would come up if they play more, 
but I'm just, I'm waiting to see. So maybe a way to do it is like, okay, well quickly with the starters has been really good. Yeah. That line has been really good. So maybe, maybe you just see Hart be the second sub in now and quickly goes in for, for RJ, like he did last year and you reverse those roles. And now quickly he's playing maybe an extra five minutes, yeah. six minutes a game that he's not getting right now. And that, that could be a tiny little adjustment that could get him up to a higher minute total, which would probably make you a better team because you have one of your rest players playing more. It's funny you say 29 minutes. I looked that up today just because I was like writing about this for the newsletter. And I just, uh, my, my like prototypical example of like a six man, that's obviously too good to be a six man, but it's best for the team is the manager Ginobili, you know, thing in San Antonio when that was going and the year he won six man of the year, he averaged more than 29 minutes for the season, but that's because he started, I think like 15 or 20 games in the games. He came off the bench. He averaged 29 minutes a night. So like it, that, that seems to be like the, the sweet spot, you know, like the about the most you could play a sub without completely like wrecking your other, like the rest of what you do. So, yeah, it's almost as if I watched the Knicks. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Almost. I, I, um, I, I promised my daughter I'd take her out for dinner. So I, I, I want to hit one last topic quickly and, and then we'll, I will get out of here. Um, cause you have a job, I guess, uh, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not really. I literally just watch basketball. If I were unemployed, my life would be no different <laughs> other than I would travel less. <laughs> You're like, what are you doing tonight? I'm watching the Kings game. And then employed me is like, what are you doing tonight? I'm watching the Kings game. The King. <laughs> Fucking yeah. what? Did you watch? Were you able to watch the, the end of last night? I actually went to bed early because I was oh, mainly you- exhausted and I missed it, but I saw what it that it might be over. I know, I know this is like the topic of the week around the NBA. We don't have to do. Okay. One more topic. I, we're not, we're not getting diverse. I could talk to you about, for, about the Warriors for a half hour. Um, Julius. Uh, so Julius Randall got his, uh, 3000 rebound. I think it was as a Nick, uh, either the last game or the game before, whatever it is. I think it was the last game. And I looked up today that puts him, uh, so he's top 20 all time, uh, in rebounds, top 20 all time at points for the Knicks. And, um, in, about a week or so, he'll get to top 20 in assists. And I sent out a tweet earlier today about who he joins. I'm going to just double check right now. I think when he gets into the top 20 in those four um, categories, he will, he'll be only the fifth Nick to be in the top 20 in those four. And here it is. Okay, he will join Patrick Ewing, Walt Clyde Flazier, uh, Richie Guerin, forgotten great Nick, played a long time ago, and Charles Oakley. Um, some pretty good Pretty good players there. Three Hall of Famers and then Oakley, who's who's really good. Uh, I just wanted to bring this up because Julius Randle's like every other night, he's like the most hated man in, in showbiz. And um, it's just interesting because he's been here for a while and he like we say what you want about him. And I know there's a lot that you could say. And you and I, you and I, it was my favorite part of the pod with Begley. And again, go listen to the pod, everybody. But I don't know. It's just really interesting. And I, he, he's the most fascinating athlete I can remember from a public perception standpoint. And I just kind of wanted to ask you, like, do you think where, where, where do you think we, where do you think we're going for the rest of the season with Julius? I guess let's phrase it like that. And we'll, we'll leave it at that. I feel like he's kind of like the new a rod in New York. That's a that's a comp. That's a comp. You know, like, spoken like a true Yankee fan. <laughs> I mean, you, well, you are for anybody who doesn't know. So I'm a huge Yankee fan. Yeah, I'm just, yes. I'm just, I'm for anybody, would, people listening may not know that. I just want to point that out. And I'm not even comparing him to A Rod because from everything you read about A Rod and hear about A Rod, you know, he's difficult and he was a cheater and all this stuff and like. That's not Julius Randall as a human being, but just in terms of the relationship that fans have with him, the playoff ups and downs, the, the sort of love hate relationship that so many Knicks fans seem to have with him, the way the fans will get frustrated and kind of his up and down on court demeanor. Uh, I, 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 I see it. I think there's a little something there. He's he's gonna have a really weird 
legacy with the Knicks. And we'll, we'll see how it ends. It might continue for a while for all we know. Like he's got years left on the contract and he might just stick around and they might be really good. And, or they might just be a team that's always good, always scrappy. They never get the trade for a star. And then he's gone and the Knicks go back to being the LOL Knicks who weren't good for 20 years. And maybe fans look back on that era as like, that we was didn't know the, how good we had the, it. Exactly. Like, I don't know. I covered, I covered the wizards and oh, yeah. you know, that, that, that team, the way they look back on Gilbert arenas, even though those arenas teams won one playoff series and never won 50 games, but the way they look back on that era is like so fond. And part of it was because arenas was so charismatic and, you know, was kind of a show everywhere that he went. But the other part of it is like that, that fan base didn't have very much to watch for a really long time leading up to Gilbert arenas. And, and I just, I wonder, I wonder what it's going to be with Julius. Cause I could see it going either way. I could see this kind of, this kind of uh, frustrate fr- frustration laden relationship kind of continuing. I could see fans with time removed being like, man, that guy averaged 20 and 10 every year was all NBA twice, one most improved player, represented the organization professionally and well, like was, you know, did wonderful stuff for the community off the court and everything like that. And just put up numbers and was kind of the face or one of the faces of the best stretch of Knicks basketball in two decades. And like, I wonder if that's going to last. Like, I feel like you could probably speak because I didn't even grow up a Knicks fan. So I, I really I, can't speak to the psyche of a Knicks fan nearly as well as you can. Like, what, I, what do you say about that? I was, I was angry, not last year, the year before, as, as you know, I, I, it made me angry. What was, what I felt was a consistent, like almost like a consistent, like F you to fans in terms of his, how he went about his business every night. It was, I was like really bothered by it. And now like, yeah, there's there's moments, right? And there's stretches of games. Like again, you guys just talked about it. Like everybody sees it. I don't get angry anymore. I've kind of accepted like this is just what he is. And I try to I, I try to maintain a more even keeled approach of like, let me not overly focus on the bad and let me appreciate the good. Like the the good deserves to be appreciated as much as the bad can be aggravating. And you watch the stretch he had against the Suns and like even like, you know, the Hornets game. Like did it put fucking 25 and 20. It was nothing. Like it was nothing. He also had an amazing passing game. He had, I know he only I, had five assists. I, yeah, but, but it was, was a better inc- passing game than oh, yeah. amazing passing game. He Absolutely. made probably 10 incredible passes in that game. So like I so I don't get angry anymore. I sympathize very much so with anybody who does it, he still gets under their skin. Because again, I was like just there two years ago. Um and I, my ultimate opinion on this, give if you, if he gave fans not even one good playoff series, like half a good playoff series in a series they advanced in, like if he if he gave the Harden performance in the uh, the Celtics series last year, Harden had two good games, I want to say, and seven, so maybe more than two, but like something like that, two three good games, and they advanced. Like I, honestly, that might even be enough to 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 to. It might be. I'm j- I'm j- I'm spitballing here. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know until I see it. I think I think you're right. I think you're right. I think that could. I think that could. That could totally swing it. It's kind of impossible to acknowledge. You know, one thing that has to get better though. What? Like the. The shooting is, is still. Not is he thirty one? Is it thirty two? Right now, from three, he's shooting twenty seven percent. Is it that? Is it twenty seven? Yeah, and he had the that that awful six game stretch to begin the season, which dragged everything down. And he's like forty six percent from the field. Played seventeen yeah, games. Yes, but he's like he's like forty six percent from the field. Yeah, he's like forty six percent from the field in the last eleven God. games. But even over that eleven game stretch, where he's averaging like twenty three, ten, and five, and his, yeah. has looked. I, I would not say he's played at the caliber that he did last season when he was all NBA, but he's definitely been much closer to that than he was in the first six games when it was, yes. I was on here last time saying crazy shit. Like 
if Julius Randle were playing better, I'd be more pessimistic. That's how upside down yeah. things were. Like yeah. he, he, he just had an inexplicable first six games. Uh, but even over this 11 game stretch where he's been a lot better, he's still shooting 30% from three and he's not taking nearly as many threes as he did last year, which was a huge strength of his game last year. Just the fact that whenever he saw the tiniest bit of space, he was going straight up from three yeah. and, and he's not making as many. And, and I'm like, we've seen his shot go in and out year to year. You know, we we've seen the jumper fall one year, jumper not yeah. fall the next year. And he doesn't have to be this assassin from three like that. That's never really going to be the case. 34, 34, 30, 35 on volume. Yeah. That, that's what he was last right. year. It was freaking great. Right. But now okay. he's, now he's, now he's 27 and the volume that's is the- down. Like he was taking like three more attempts a game last year too. Yeah. And, and I think both those need to change. I think he needs to take more threes. He's playing a little more with his back to the basket right now than he did last year. I'm not obsessed with that. Even though when he ends up catching the ball deeper in the paint, I'm kind of fine with it. Like a, a five foot turnaround is a fine shot for him. It's it the is. 12 foot ones, the nine foot ones that aren't as great. Uh, but I, I, he's playing a little more of his back to the basket. If he can get faced up a little bit more, if he can take a couple more threes a game and just raise that percentage like a smidgen. 33, 34%. Then we're talking. But if he's taking five a game and he's shooting 30%, like that, yes. that's a problem that is going to mess with the spacing. And yet, despite that season from him and despite the fact that uh, only the aforementioned Jalen Brunson and Emmanuel quickly and Isaiah Hardenstein, don't forget about Isaiah Hardenstein having a great year, uh, are shooting above the median in terms of uh, their their league average for their positions and effective field goal percentage. Um, they're still 11th in offense. So I guess all things considered, um, things could be worse, as we say. All right. Yes, I would Fred, say but- Hartenstein. No, I was going to say, I would say Hartenstein is underappreciated, but I think it probably speaks to the intelligence of Knicks fans to say that I actually don't think he's underappreciated. I think he's properly underappreciated. But we properly never appre- ever... Yeah, yeah we, never, we never talk about him. And... He's having a great year. I just, he's having, he's a top five backup center. Oh, he, without question. He's, he's been like, can, I can't even think of a night where I was like, oh, Hartenstein didn't play well tonight. He's just exactly the same every single night. He's good defensively. He's protecting the rim. He's a really good team defender. He's, he's making great passes within the offense, fantastic outlet passes. He's setting great screens. He's making the smartest of plays. He's finishing around the rim, getting tons of offensive boards. Like he just, he does the exact same thing every single game. It's just, it's wild how consistent he is. And the, um, the blocks he's had, man, (laughs) at the frame. That's fucking, it's fun. It's really cool because it's like, you know, you might not look at him and expect that, but man, he gets in there and he is fearless. It's really cool. I love Isaiah Hart. I love him and the Mitch, him and the the, the two of them together. It's, it's it's good stuff. You had a great story about them. Um, again, uh, one more time, one one more shameless plug. I'll let, I'll let you say it. They, they really are like insanely close friends and they are they are completely and utterly ridiculous together. Like talking to the two of them together is, it is insane. I wore, I wore a button down shirt to the game yesterday and kind of had like, a, you know, like the Seinfeld bit, like the second yeah. button makes second the shirt. Button. It really is true because if I button the second button on this shirt, it was, it's too high. I was going to look like I was joking myself, but I unbuttoned it and I was just showing off too much chest. Too like much. I'm not the kind of guy who can show off that much chest. And so the second I saw that Isaiah Hartenstein saw me at the game yesterday, and as I've said on this podcast before, he calls me by my legal first name, Matthew, as does Mitch, because the only people in the world who call me Matthew are my mom and the two centers on the Knicks. And Hartenstein sees me and says, Matthew, button that thing up, button that up. And then he immediately says to me, you better not go in the locker room. And I said, why? He said, Mitch is not going to leave you alone once he sees that button. <laughs> That's great. I was like, these, these two. That's it's, these they're a good, uh, they're a good, uh, a good sitcom waiting to happen. All right. I got, I really have to get out of here. Um, as always, I could talk to you for a very long time and um, spoiler alert, 
I will be talking to you again soon. That's all I'll say. Right. On on I won't I won't I won't say where, but it's on patreon.com slash cats and shoot. <laughs> How about those pistons, by the way? No. Okay. Fred Cats, he also writes, by the way, for the athletic. You're actually playing the pistons tomorrow. I the know. one time that we could have talked we about the pistons. <laughs> and Andrew wouldn't have cut us off. <laughs> we never talked about the pistons. <laughs> There is a pregame pod coming about the Pistons that you could listen to there. So I can't wait there. to listen to the fucking pregame pod about a mm-hmm. team that has lost a billion games in a row. Watch, they're going to beat the Knicks out there. Then. Sure. They'll beat the Lakers first ahead of time. You negative Nelly. They're not losing to the Pistons. Uh, if they... I don't, mm. Anyway, the PTSD. land the plan. Let's get out of here. Okay. Uh, Fred Katz, uh, you're right for the athletic. Uh, read Fred Katz every day. And you could also, also now listen to Fred Katz nearly every day. Um, he's the best that there is. Uh, there's a reason why I just have nothing but uh, gratitude and, and a genuine love and appreciation for what he uh, not only does in his job, but like what he does for us here at Next Film School. Um, thank you, Fred. You're the man. You you are the man. I I love this podcast. Listen to it all the time. You guys are, you guys are amazing. And uh, I'm I'm very excited to see uh, you know how my podcast falls off when I have my next guest on at patreon.com slash cats and don't, don't look at the metrics. All right, uh, everybody out there, thanks uh, for checking out another episode of the Next Film School Podcast. We'll be back with more funny games before you know it. One final thing, just to close the loop before you go. What? This is the CBA. Oh, Positionless Christ. voting. All NBA and all defensive team voters will be directed to vote the yeah. most deserved players. So, <laughs> like a mean <laughs> well, There you old. go. You guys might be a hundred years old. I just had right to land the man. plane there. You're good. <laughs> we're both. We're both. We're both leaning in like we're like Mark Berman on a Zoom press conference <laughs> in 2020. <laughs> that was the best. Every Zoom press conference with Berman. Yeah. Berman's like all the way over here, being like, "So, uh, <laughs> question for Tom." 